All right, we just finished quiz 12.2. We're going to learn about radiation effects, nuclear power, and we're going to turn in daily work 12.2. Um, so here we go, maybe. Come on. Okay, radiation exposure in real life. There's a lot of things that go around us all the time that we are exposed to. Radio broadcasts, um, MRIs are down in the radio spectrum. They're actually low energy, believe it or not. X-rays are high energy. Um, cosmic rays, baggage screen. You can sort of see a lot of different things. Visible light, UV light, um, wireless data, microwaves. Um, Lots of different things that, that bombard us with radiation. Um, to give you an idea how big these waves are, um, for instance, like an MRI is about the size of a football field. It's a very long wave, not very energetic. But if we get up here to where x-rays are, it's the size of an atom. Okay, yep. All right, so... Um, Go ahead, Ra radi radiation, no problem, sterilization. Um, as we look at it, there's several different ways that we can detect radiation. Um, there's what's called a scintillation meter, which is a, just a small meter. And basically it works on the effect that as you go through, radiation comes in, it hits a light, it, it excites that light, which now excites a, a photomultiplier, and then it measures the, the amount and it's between an anode and a cathode, and we've talked about those in the last unit, okay? A film badge actually works on basically how much I get, it changes colors. So the more radiation I get, the darker it becomes, sort of like knocks it off. A Geiger counter was the other thing that we talked about last time. It is like um, the Ghostbusters thing. This actually comes off, and you actually open it up, and then in, in those little holes right here, it can get... Um, have the radiation go in, and you just measure it by, you know, how much is how many times it got hit. And that bottom part right here is just a really big battery. That's all it is. Okay. Okay. So as you're writing in, this is what we need reading. Need to be doing a radiation detection device operating on the principle that gives uh, that phosphorus to give off light when it's struck by radiation. So that's all that's happening there. Um, a film badge provides a convenient way to monitor the total amount of radiation that you received in a specific amount of time, but it doesn't really narrow down what kind. It's just a total amount. And then a radiation detecting device operating on the principle of that ions form when radiation passes through a tube filled with low pressure gas. And that tube is just that little end thing right here. And it's just about that long. Okay. All right, so medical uses of radioisotopes. First of all, we have tracers. And tracers are a radioisotope that's used medically because it progresses through the body or localization to specific organs. And it, it sort of um, pools in that specific organ. Or we can follow it through. Okay? Hot spots are tissue which radioactive concentrate, um, tracers concentrate. Cold spots are tissues where they don't concentrate. Okay? So they use both of those to see which ones um, are good and, and bad as far as cancer and, and things like that. Um, this one right here is a tracer where they use a swallow test and they watch the barium go through and find out what process it's going through um, to get to your stomach and then through the intestines and out. Okay. So what uh, is the radiology community doing to appropriately manage radiation exposure to patients during exams? Well, if you go for a dental x-ray, they put the x-ray apron on you, right? Um, at your age, you should also be asking for the thyroid protector. It's a little part that goes right here. Um, it protects your thyroid from thyroid cancer, and they think that um, the increase in the, all the thyroid um, cancer incidences is because they didn't have the thyroid protector before. So as you go to, to the dentist, if they don't put that on, or if the apron doesn't have a thyroid protector, ask for it. Um, they're also making sure they, they get the results with a minimum amount of, of exposure. So 
What do we also worry about with tracers? They've got to have short half-lives. They've got to get out of the, out of the system quickly. Um, the daughter produced by the tracer should be non-toxic. So when it, it radioactively de decomposes from the parent to the daughter, we want the daughter not to be radioactive. Um, the radioisotope half-life should be long enough that it can be prepared, moved to the hospital, and then put into the patient with enough time to actually get results. Um, and then the radiation should be given off should be gamma rays to ensure that it will go out of the body or leave the body, not bounce around inside the body causing damage. Um, and we want it to be detected outside the body. If we had alpha or beta, it would not be detected outside the body. And the radioisotope should concentrate to form a hot spot or cold spot. So when I take the x-ray, I know what I'm seeing. Okay, it helps me in diagnosis. You don't have to put that word for word. You can put it in your own words. But I did try to make them as small as possible for you. It was a fun hour on the freeway this morning with a big wreck right in front of Hillfield. Yeah, I was stuck on the freeway with no exit. <laughs> That's because everybody was trying to get off the freeway because of the big accident. All right, everybody okay? Got it? Okay, going forward, was that a yes? Adriana, do you have it? Okay, keep, do you need me to read one? It's down at the bottom or you got them? Okay. Welcome to spring in Utah, it snows. Yep. We're like a month away from summer, and it's snowing. Yeah. Well, so official summer isn't like till the middle of June. Okay, we okay? All right. So going forward here, positron emission to topography is PEAT, what's called PEAT scans. Um, they use radioisotopes, which emit positrons, remember positrons are positive electrons, which enable the scanning of organs, so they can actually see where the organs are. Um, PET scans can detect tumors, coronary artery disease, Alzheimer's disease, and track the progress of cancer. Um, PET scans are a non-invasive way of monitoring ca um, cancer treatment. Instead of cutting them open to see what, where the cancer is gone, um, they can now just watch. So the first one on the left is a pre, um, where before they start treating cancer on the, on the right, they've, they've got the cancer somewhat under control. It still has, um, you, you can still see that there's some cancer in there that it hasn't gone away. But for the most part, it has. But you can also see that it's migrated and it's now in the brain is bad. Okay, any other questions here? Let's go ahead and go forward. No, nope, right. Okay, we got the, okay. 
All right, so these are some of the things that we use in medicine, different isotopes. So different isotopes go different places. Um, Xenon-133 is a lung function. So if they want to worry, they're worried about your lungs, that's what they give you. Technetium-99, they give you for bone scans and also for gallbladder function and also for gastrointestinal bleeding. So it's a lot with uh, um, the in gastrointestinal and bone. Iodine is used for your butterfly, which is your thyroid right here, okay? Um, phosphorus is to treat leukemias and lymphomas. Iridium-192, um, cancers of the breast. And thallium-201, heart function. So if you turn to the next page, you should be writing these down, I'm believing. Yes or no? I can't remember. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry I didn't give you the lovely um, diagram of the innards, but you can get main ideas here. So technetium actually has three different things. So you only have to write t technetium 99 once, and then you can put bone scan, gallbladder, and gastrointestinal bleeding. Yep. But like I said, those three on the, on the left, you can just put technetium 99 once, and then put the three things that it is used for because it's used more commonly. Finishing that, I'll look and see what time because the period today is really weird. 9.15, you're right. So we get out of here at 9.15. Just let me put it up here so I know what time we get out. If you need to see any of the bottoms, let me know and I'll read them off to you. Oh, some of you are at a bad angle to see that. Lymphomas are, you have lots of lymph nodes, like there's some underneath here, there's some under your armpits, there's different parts of your body. Um, so if they get into, the cancers get into those, they start growing. All right, we good? Those of you that are slower, not quite? Okay. I don't mean to give you pen cramp today. Purposely, anyway. Uh -huh. No, it was 12.2 and 12.3. I'll have to figure out when, it, when we stop, when it stops. Okay, you ready? No? Thallium 201, heart function. Got it? Okay. All right, so ex other examples that you could have put down, you don't have to have all of them, you just need to have some. Um, carbon-14 is also used a lot. Carbon-14 is used for dating. We already talked about that last time. But it's also used to determine steps involved in photosynthesis. On the far side there, it's used to study metabolic changes in um, patients with di diabetes, gout, and anemia. 
Um, phosphorus 32 is used in research involving biology and um, genetics. That's 32 and 33. Selenium 75, protein studies in life sciences. Strontium 85, meta metabolism, how your metabolic system works and bone formations. Hydrogen 3 or titanium um, used to study the science, life, science, uh, life science and drug metabolism. Cobalt 60, radiation therapy to prevent cancer. Iodine-131 to locate brain tumors and monitor, monitor cardiac and liver and thyroid activity. Um, they actually have that, so it will report in colors now. Um, Carbon-11 is tagged to, onto glucose to monitor organs during a PET scan. Um, and sodium-24 to study blood circulation. They're looking for artery, um, what do you call it, reductions. Um, thallium-201, damage to the heart and detection of tumors. And technetium, we talked about that on the last one. So there's a lot of different ones that they use. Um, I have not listed all of them, and you won't have all of them in your notes. But notice, know that a lot, we use a lot of the radioactive isotopes in medical. So chemistry around us. When we have radon, radon is very common in our area um, because of all the granite. And I told you before, granite is radioactive, and radon is one of the byproducts. Um, it comes in through cracks in, in your basement. And radon is a gas. And the problem is if that gas builds up, it can cause a lot of problems, a lot of health risk. Um, so what do they do if you've got radon in your house? They install fans so that they can get the radon out. So they do evac fans, and you're fine. It's a problem is with radon is if it builds up. And radon is a gas. It doesn't have any smell. It doesn't have any, any way to detect it other than a radon detection kit. So um, that's been a problem here along the Wasatch Front. How radon gas affects humans is it's radioactive. It comes from natural decay of uranium that is found in your, nearly all soils. Um, it typically moves through the ground to the air above and into your homes through cracks and holes in the foundations, like I just told you. Your home traps the radon where it can build up, and then as it builds up, this is where it causes problems. Um, radioactive decay elements um, continue to decay, and what you do is you suck them in, you breathe them in, and then they start decaying inside your lungs um, because they, they're attached and they can't be taken out. Um, there are alpha particles and energy bursts that may affect the cells of the lung, and that might lead to lung cancer because we have DNA damage. So non-medical uses of radioisotopes, um, radioactive dating. We want to see how old something is. The most common one that we use is carbon-14, um, but that only works for a certain amount of time. Um, we compare carbon-14, because carbon-14 is taken in by live things, and when those live things die, no more carbon-14 is taken in. And so as a carbon-14 decays, we can compare it to something that's live at that same area to see how old that something is. Okay, so argue... Oh, yep. I think it's... Well, I don't know. I think the next one is the one that's um, fractured for you where you have just words. So it's a process of determining the age of artifacts and rocks based on the amount and half-life of those radioisotopes containing, contained in the object. And we're going to have, uh, we're going to do, I'm going to set up a cloud chamber for you next time, and you'll actually be able to see alpha and beta particles coming off of a lantern mantle. It's pretty cool. One more time, a process for determining the age of artifacts and rocks based on the amount and half-life of radioisotopes contained in the object. We good to go? Okay. All right, so radiocarbon dating uses the half-life of carbon, 14, to determine the age of carbon-containing materials. I like this. I don't know if you can read it very well because I had to stretch it. You say our date has lasted forever, but I can prove otherwise by measuring the breakdown of a common element. <laughs> um, the ratio of radioactive carbon-14 to carbon-12 um, is a constant value in living organisms because we're breathing. 
So we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. And so it's constant, and we're eating carbon-based things. Once an organism dies, like I was telling you before, the carbon-14 decays without being replenished. So by comparing the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in artifacts to the same ratio present in organisms today, the age of the artifact can be determined. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. And they usually only do carbon-14 if it's um, five half-lifes, sometimes six half-lifes or less. Because once you get to that point, remember, that's an exponential decay like we did with our thing, and it sort of goes off into that area between one and zero. And as you get out farther and farther, the percent error goes up exponentially. Okay. How are we doing? We good? 5,730 5, years is the last one. Okay, we're going to watch a little video, hopefully. Hi everyone, Karis Anna Maria here. The Earth is 4.54 billion years old. 3.8 billion years ago, the very first life form came into existence. 225 million years ago, dinosaurs came on the scene, and man took his first steps in Africa 200,000 years ago. How do we know this to be true? Science. One of the ways that researchers measure the age of organic material is through carbon-14 dating. In 1960, Willard Libby won a Nobel Prize for developing this technology. See, all living things contain carbon, which has six protons and six neutrons. So in its typical form, we call it carbon-12. But at any given time, there are trace amounts of carbon-14, or C-14, in the atmosphere. C-14 is a radioactive isotope that's made when cosmic rays bombard nitrogen atoms at high altitudes, converting them into this excited form. When some living things, like plants and algae, make their own food through photosynthesis, they take in carbon dioxide from the air. Trace amounts of C14 make up a tiny percentage of that carbon dioxide, and it's integrated into the tissues of the organism. Then creatures that can't make their own food through photosynthesis, like us, eat the ones that can, and that C14 is taken into our bodies as well. And because there's a consistent quantity of C14 in the atmosphere, there's a constant corresponding quantity of it in the bodies of all living things, at least while they're still alive. C14 is radioactive. That doesn't mean it's dangerous, only that it's unstable. Over time, it decays back into nitrogen. See, when an organism dies, it stops taking in carbon. And the C14 in the organism's tissue starts to decay at a precise speed. But the amount of carbon-12 stays the same since it's not radioactive. We know that it takes 5,730 years for half of the C14 in a sample to decay. It takes another 5,730 years for half of what's left to decay, and so on. This is C14's half-life. All radioactive isotopes have one. And if we compare the amount of C14 in a dead thing to the amount of regular carbon-12, voila, we can find out how old it is. Now, some people who think that the Earth is only 6,000 years old may base their claims on words in the Bible, not measurable evidence. And one ploy they use to cast doubt on radiocarbon dating is to point out its shortcomings. For example, C14 has a relatively short half-life, so anything older than 50,000 years has too little C14 left to make an accurate calculation of its age. But C14 isn't the only radioisotope out there. There are tons of them. If I wanted to find out the age of a dinosaur fossil, I might measure its uranium-235 concentration, which is a half-life of 704 million years. Radioactive isotopes like potassium-40 and rubidium-87 have half-lives in the billions of years. Critics also like to point out that over time, the amount of C14 in the Earth's atmosphere may have varied. But scientists know this, so they make corresponding adjustments to their measurements. And radioisotope dating may be one of the more sophisticated methods we use to know the age of fossils, but it's not the only one. Millions of fossils have been pulled from the Earth, and by the 1800s, we realized that consistently and predictably, older rock is found below younger rock, and older fossils are found below younger ones within that rock. With age comes progress. Younger things are more complex, more... Okay, I didn't like what she went to past that, so we're going to go on. <laughs> 
basically that was that what part was okay. Um, induced nuclear reactions. You, we're going to start talking about nuclear reactors. So when we have a nuclear reactor reaction in a nuclear reactor, we have moderators. These are materials that are capable of slowing down neutrons that pass through them, and we need that. Otherwise, the reaction gets out of control, and we end up with a bomb um, that's gone off instead of a nuclear reaction um, that we can control and get energy off of. A cyclotron is a cyclic pack, pa particle accelerator that works to change the electrical polarities as charged particles cross a gap. This part of, the particles are kept moving in a spiral path by a strong magnetic field. This is how we found the last several um, elements on the periodic table. They've actually started working on um, 119, 120, 121, and 122. Um, but they're getting them by using an accelerator, by smashing one element into another element. Some linear accelerators that have been used now in medical are the link. Maybe some of you have heard of that, um, where they can actually accelerate particles through, um, use radiation to kill cancers. Um, a particle accelerator that works by changing electrical polarities as charged particles cross a gap that we just talked about. This one is in California. It's, I can't remember how many miles long. I want to say 18 miles long in a straight path. Um, they've got one in um, Europe. Oh, I didn't show it. It's called the Hadron, Hadline, Hadron Collider. It goes through four countries or five countries. I can't remember which, but it's a big circle, and it takes the energy of all those countries to run it, and it has to be run at almost zero, cal zero degrees Kelvin. Okay? So when we talk about transuranium, these elements are all man-made transuranium. That means past uranium. Um, they are synthetic and unstable, so they're all radioactive. Once you get past uranium, they're all, your, all radioactive. Chandra, oh, here, uh, yep. Synthetic and unstable. I would just put transuranium elements are synthetic, unstable, and disintegrate quickly. That's what I would write. We okay to go forward? Okay, so this is the Hadron Collider. It actually goes through several countries. Um, it was, there was a big stink when they first made it, thinking that when it went online, it would cause the end of the world because they said that it would be making antiparticles, which it does, and that the world would collapse, but it hasn't, <laughs> and turn into a black hole. That's what they thought it was. It would happen. They actually, there was actually a book and a movie made about it um, that said that that it would go into a black hole, um, but it is a big. This is the inside of it. And this is showing basically what they're seeing at the end. The particles are swirling, and they, they hit, and they make a new particle that they're able to see for a certain amount of time. The tunnel is 17 miles long and lay, lies between the Swiss and French borders. Um, so it's not, I thought it was four countries. There, I think there's a couple little countries in there, but I'm not sure. Um, and the speed of light smashed them together so scientists can see the resulting debris. And they've been able to see a lot of different particles giving off. Now they know that... We already knew, um, besides protons, electrons, and neutrons, each proton is made up of, of smaller parts, and each neutron is made up of smaller parts, and so are the electrons, and so they're just finding more and more. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about nuclear power. And I'm going to have you watch three videos. And I believe in your notes it has you have a place for pros and cons. I want you just to write down your thoughts on each of them. You get to make a decision. Are you pro or con? Um, and we'll go through each of these. There's three videos, though. The first one just is more of an introduction. Have you ever been in an argument about nuclear power? We have, and we found it frustrating and confusing. So let's try and get to grips with this topic. I'm going to turn that volume down a little bit. It's a little loud.
It all started in the 1940s. After the shock and horror of the war and the use of the atomic bomb, nuclear energy promised to be a peaceful spin-off of the new technology, helping the world get back on its feet. Everyone's imagination was running wild. Would electricity become free? Could nuclear power help settle the Antarctic? Would there be nuclear-powered cars, planes, or houses? It seemed that this was just a few years of hard work away. One thing was certain, the future was atomic. Just a few years later, there was a sort of atomic age hangover. As it turned out, nuclear power was very complicated and very expensive. Turning physics into engineering was easy on paper, but hard in real life. Also, private companies thought that nuclear power was much too risky as an investment. Most of them would much rather stick with gas, coal and oil. But there were many people who didn't just want to abandon the promise of the atomic age. An exciting new technology, the prospect of enormously cheap electricity, the prospect of being independent of oil and gas imports, and in some cases, a secret desire to possess atomic weapons provided a strong motivation to keep going. Nuclear power's finest hour finally came in the early 1970s when war in the Middle East caused oil prices to skyrocket worldwide. Now, commercial interest and investment picked up at a dazzling pace. More than half of all the nuclear reactors in the world were built between 1970 and 1985. But which type of reactor to build, given how many different types there were to choose from? A surprising underdog candidate won the day, the light water reactor. It wasn't very innovative, and it wasn't too popular with scientists, but it had some decisive advantages. It was there, it worked, and it wasn't terribly expensive. So, what does a light water reactor do? Well, the basic principle is shockingly simple. It heats up water using an artificial chain reaction. Nuclear fission releases several million times more energy than any chemical reaction could. Really heavy elements on the brink of stability, like uranium-235, get bombarded with neutrons. The neutron is absorbed, but the result is unstable. Most of the time, it immediately splits into fast-moving, lighter elements, some additional free neutrons, and energy in the form of radiation. The radiation heats the surrounding water, while the neutrons repeat the process with other atoms, releasing more neutrons and radiation in a closely controlled chain reaction. Very different from the fast, destructive runaway reaction in an atomic bomb. In our light water reactor, a moderator is needed to control the neutron's energy. Simple, ordinary water does the job, which is very practical since water is used to drive the turbines anyway. The light water reactor became prevalent because it's simple and cheap. However, it's neither the safest, most efficient, nor technically elegant nuclear reactor. The renewed nuclear hype lasted barely a decade though. In 1979, the Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania barely escaped a catastrophe when its core melted. In 1986, the Chernobyl catastrophe directly threatened Central Europe with a radioactive cloud, and in 2011, the drawn-out Fukushima disaster sparked new discussions and concerns. While in the 1980s, 218 new nuclear power reactors went live, their number and nuclear's global share of electricity production has stagnated since the end of the 80s. So what's the situation today? Today, nuclear energy meets around 10% of the world's energy demand. There are about 439 nuclear reactors in 31 countries. About 70 new reactors are under construction in 2015, most of them in countries which are growing quickly. All in all, 160 new reactors are planned worldwide. Most nuclear reactors were built more than 25 years ago with pretty old technology. More than 80% are various types of light water reactor. Today, many countries are faced with a choice. The expensive replacement of the aging reactors, possibly with more efficient but less tested models, or a move away from nuclear power towards newer or older technology with different cost and environmental impacts. So, should we use nuclear energy? The pro and contra arguments will be presented here next week. Subscribe and then... So we're going to do the con first and then the pro. Three reasons why we should stop using nuclear energy. 1. Nuclear weapons proliferation. Nuclear technology made a violent entrance onto the world stage. Just one year after the world's first ever nuclear test explosion in 1944, two large cities were destroyed by just two single bombs. After that, reactor technology slowly evolved as a means of generating electricity, but it's always been intimately connected with nuclear weapons technology. 
It's nearly impossible to develop nuclear weapons without access to reactor technology. In fact, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty serves the purpose of spreading nuclear reactor technology without spreading nuclear weapons with limited success. In 40 years, five countries have developed their own weapons with the help of reactor technology. The fact of the matter is that it can be very hard to distinguish a covert nuclear weapons program from the peaceful use of nuclear energy. In the 1970s, the big nuclear powers were happily selling peaceful technology to smaller countries, which then developed weapons of their own. The road to deadly nuclear weapons is always paved with peaceful reactors. 2. Nuclear Waste and Pollution Spent nuclear fuel is not only radioactive, but also contains extremely poisonous chemical elements like plutonium. It loses its harmfulness only slowly over several tens of thousands of years. And there is also a process called reprocessing, which means the extraction of plutonium from spent nuclear fuel. It can be used for two purposes, to build nuclear weapons or to use it as new fuel. But hardly any of it is used as fuel because we don't have the right kind of reactors for that. A milligram will kill you, a few kilograms make an atomic bomb, and even an inconspicuous country like Germany literally has tons of the stuff just lying around because reprocessing sounded like a good idea decades ago. And where will all the waste go? After dumping it into the ocean was forbidden, we've tried to bury it, but we can't find a place where it will definitely stay secure for tens of thousands of years. Over 30 countries operate nearly 400 reactors, managing several hundred thousands of tons of nuclear waste, and only one is currently serious about opening a permanent civilian waste storage, tiny Finland. 3. Accidents and Disasters over 60 years of nuclear power usage, there have been seven major accidents in reactors or facilities dealing with nuclear waste. Three of those were mostly contained, but four of them released significant amounts of radioactivity into the environment. In 1957, 1987 and 2011, large areas of land in Russia, Ukraine and Japan were rendered unfit for human habitation for decades to come. The number of deaths is highly disputed, but probably lies in the thousands. These disasters happened with nuclear reactors of very different types, in very different countries, and several decades apart. Looking at the numbers, we may as well ask ourselves, are 10% of the world's energy supply worth a devastating disaster every 30 years? Would 30% be worth another Fukushima or Chernobyl somewhere on Earth every 10 years? What area would have to be contaminated, so we say, no more? Where is the line? So. Should we use nuclear energy? The risks may outweigh the benefits, and maybe we should stop looking into this direction and drop this technology for good. If you want to hear the other side of the argument, or a short... Here's the other side of the argument. Three reasons why we should continue using nuclear energy. One, nuclear energy saves lives. In 2013, a study conducted by NASA found that nuclear energy has prevented around 1.8 million deaths. Even if you include the death tolls from Chernobyl and Fukushima, nuclear energy ranks last in death per energy unit produced. While nuclear waste is really toxic, it's usually stored somewhere, while the toxic byproducts of fossil fuels are pumped into the air we breathe every day. So, just by reducing the amount of fossil fuels burned, countless cases of cancer or lung disease and accidents in coal mines have been avoided. If we can choose between lots of dangerous stuff being put into a deep hole and lots and lots and lots of dangerous stuff being pumped into the atmosphere, the former seems more logical. Nuclear energy feels way more dangerous though. Single catastrophic events burn into our memory while coal and oil kill silently. It's like the death rate of flying versus driving. Even in the best case scenario, it would take at least 40 years to switch to 100% renewable energy. So for as long as we continue using fossil fuels, nuclear energy will save way more lives than it destroys. 2. Nuclear energy reduces CO2 emissions. Nuclear energy is arguably way less harmful to the environment in terms of climate change than fossil fuels, our main source of energy. Since 1976, about 64 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions have not been pumped out thanks to nuclear energy. And by the mid-21st century, that could amount to an additional 80 to 240 gigatons. Humanity's energy consumption is rising steadily. 
According to U.S. government projections, China alone will add the equivalent of a new 600 megawatt coal plant every 10 days for the next 10 years. China already burns 4 billion tons of coal each year. Coal is cheap, relatively abundant, and easy to get to, so it's not likely that humanity will stop using it soon. Nuclear energy might be the only way of dampening the effects of climate change and preventing a catastrophic man-made global warming. Compared to the other things we do, nuclear energy is relatively clean. So, even if it is a good idea to quit nuclear energy long term, it might be a good solution for the next hundred years or so, compared to the alternatives. 3. New Technologies Maybe technology will solve the problem of nuclear waste and dangerous power plants. The nuclear reactors we've used so far are mostly outdated technology, because nuclear innovation stopped in the 1970s. There are models like the thorium reactor that could solve the problem altogether. Thorium is abundant, really hard to turn into nuclear weapons, and up to two orders of magnitude less wasteful than current nuclear reactors. The waste material might also be only dangerous for a few hundred years, in contrast to a couple of thousand years. One ton of thorium is estimated to provide the same amount of energy as 200 tons of uranium or 3.5 million tons of coal. So while we cannot know for sure if alternative nuclear technology will keep its promises, shouldn't we at least do more research before we forego an opportunity to solve lots of humanity's current problems? It might not be an easy challenge, but that hasn't stopped us before. So, should we use nuclear energy? There are risks involved in any great human endeavor, and we have to make an informed decision rather than rely on gut feeling. If you want to hear the other side of the argument... Okay, so I want you to take a few minutes and talk with your neighbor and decide what... Well, before you talk to your neighbor, decide if you're for or against nuclear power and in what situation you would be for or against it. And then we're going to talk to your neighbor. And see what side they're on and then as a class we're, we're going to have a debate real quick okay so take two or three minutes do that that means talk Okay, got another two minutes. One last minute, guys. It's a one minute timer.
Okay, well that was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, think not. Okay, so what I'd like you to do, just to give us a little break, I want you to, to choose a side. Over here is for, over here is against. Get up and move. So four by the periodic table, against by the door. Once you get there, I want you to choose a spokesman or spokeswoman to defend your position. The rest of you are going to have to help in the background. Nope, you got to make. You got to choose a side for or against. Okay, talk to each other. Decide a spokesperson. And they're going to defend your position. And you better talk about the, defi the position you have. I would pick somebody that's passionate about it. You guys are talking so well. <laughs> you already know, huh? Okay, 30 seconds. We're going to bait it. Okay, make sure you have your person that's going to do it. The rest of you aren't off the hook, though. What? It would be kind of funny to see more. Just saying. Okay, I'd like to have the person that's pro right here, the person that's con right here. Okay, at any time that you feel uncomfortable up here and would like to tag out, you may tag out to anyone in your team. <laughs> okay? All right, you're going to have a 30 seconds to tell your part, and then the other person will get 30 seconds to tell their part, and then you'll get a 15-second rebuttal. Okay? Um, let's see. I don't have a coin. Does anybody have a coin? Okay, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 10. Okay, you want to go first or you want to go last? Okay. Yeah. All right, ready? Go. All right, so basically, we've got an issue with coal polluting the atmosphere, and it's going to just destroy the earth in a few years. We don't do anything. Nuclear energy can be dangerous, but also, like, most of the technology that we've had is really old and not very safe, and I feel like it's mostly human error, all the mistakes that we made. So if we do it properly with safety precautions, then we can make cleaner energy and potentially save more lives than we would harm, and a lot more lives than coal. Okay, go. Is it, is it my rebuttal now? Nope, it's your turn to okay. say, say why you think this. Right. So I think that as it stands right now, there's just not enough research and there's not enough technology that we can properly utilize it. Before we proceed any further, we should at least uh, do a lot more research and figure it out because it could potentially have a lot of benefits, but as it stands right now, it doesn't do a lot of benefits. Okay, rebuttal. Well, so to me, it sounds like you're saying that you're pro nuclear energy because you want to just do more research, which is exactly what I want to do. I just want more research into it and then use that research. Okay, rebuttal. Whatever you want to rebut. Okay, so right now, um, we, we don't have as much of a problem as a lot of people would say. Uh, there's always the claim that's made that we only have a few years left because of the carbon pollution. That was made in like 1984. It was made in 2000 when Al Gore said we had like 12 years left. And every time like he, he, people would say that New York would be flooded Kay. or whatever. And it's never actually happened. Uh, nature puts out more carbon in a, a year than humanity has 
uh, humanity has put out ever. And so the, the problem with carbon isn't the pollution, it's the efficiency. So uh, I, I am, I, I would be pro-nuclear energy if, if we could get more data on it and prove that it's uh, more useful and, uh, and safe and, and cheap than the current system. But uh, again, we need to do more research and we're very far away from being to that point. Okay, he went over his 15 seconds. Do you have anything else left to say? Well, to counter that, if you look at China, uh, their major cities are toxic to breathe, and, and that comes directly from burning, like, coal in the areas, and it has killed millions of people every year due to this in major cities in China. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure on the numbers of that. I don't think it's in the millions. It is. But uh, the the pollution the pollution in uh, toxicity is a different issue than if you're talking about climate change. So climate change, the, the data has shown that the average temperature has risen by one degree over the last hundred years. There is no evidence to suggest that that's because of humans specifically. Now we we can say the that pollution does cause death, which it does, and that's why we want to move towards nuclear energy. But that we're not to the point yet where nuclear energy is safe. Okay, I want you to tag out. Who wants to come in? Don't, don't say who wants to. Tag out. Right. Tag out. You choose. And both of you, tag out. Go, go, go. Go, go. Okay. <laughs> okay, one last rebuttal. One last rebuttal. Go. What? 15 seconds. Go. Anything else you want to say about what was said? I kind of wasn't listening. Oh. No, I, mean, I was, but I was also trying to think about something to say. Okay. Can I tag out? <laughs> <laughs> Not until you say something. I think Connor wants to go. I'm trying to remember what was said within the last five minutes. I'm kind of tired. Um, yeah, I'll just... See, I'm... Poo-poo <laughs> head. Oh, wow. Oh. Um, kind of like what you said. Um, I'm just going to say nuclear energy is bad. I'll think of something. Okay. <laughs> All right. You said nuclear energy is bad, right? Yeah. You just... But you put no evidence in. See, it, okay. nuclear energy is good because it will get rid of all the pollution like that was talked about before. The coal, the, even the CO2 emissions that are, according to a lot of scientists, causing global warming. So. Nuclear energy, you know, there's been a lot of accidents and disasters like we saw, you know, the TV. You know, a lot of places have been inhabitable for people because of all those nuclear disasters. Just imagine what could happen in the future. You know, there could be even more nuclear disasters and it get worse. And also, a lot of people in countries are using nuclear energy um, to create weapons such as North Korea, it, it, the rocket guy, and whatever the Kim Jong -un. Rocky, um, he said that he's going to stop using, like, or that he's trying to destroy these areas where they're making them, yet he's coming out even more with more energy, like, with more weapons, and imagine what will happen in the future within the next couple of years, especially with our president, he isn't smart, you know, what if we're I'm sorry, but like, he hasn't said some, he hasn't, he's done some good. This is but. nuclear, not political. <laughs> yeah, let's not go political. <laughs> oh, it will, it's very political, but it's not political in here. <laughs> what if something wrong is said about someone, and then we're going to have a big war, and if we were going to go to a holocaust, we wouldn't last a few weeks. Okay, so, tag out one more time. Tag out one more time. One last tag. She changed sides, so this should be interesting. <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs>
Okay, whoever wants to go first. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> okay, so um, the nuclear business, the nuclear power business is really risky because not very many people want to go in it because the, um, the like, product of the business is not good, obviously. Like he said, we're putting money into these weapons that could blow up our world in that second when we can be putting the money into other things. It also is creating a lot of nuclear waste that's just being put in places causing more pollution. I feel like if we begin to use nuclear energy more, we will learn more about it, and therefore it will become safer for us to use, and in the long run, save the entire planet. I feel like, I okay. Doctor, yeah, you can rebut. Okay, I feel like we're getting enough power already through natural resources like water and electricity and other things, and so our, um, we shouldn't be putting this like harmful substance into a powerhouse that we can like, get out of, I guess, is what I was going to say. Yes, but we can't use water for every source of energy as, like, a lot of our renewable sources of energy can't be used for everything, so. Why not? <laughs> because we haven't come up with the knowledge to be able to use that for that yet. But we don't have enough knowledge for nuclear power either. But <laughs> I've been saying that the data, we don't have any we've, on that. We've been using those sources of energy for years and years. We still don't have enough knowledge to use it for everything, so why not try something that we could possibly be able to use for everything someday in the future? And okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and let it stop. Kind of it's getting heated. Okay, so one more, one more, one more. you want to do one more? Yeah. Do you guys want to do one more? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Tag out one more time. I just don't want it to get too heated. We're about to win the war. <laughs> You're about to win the war. Okay. <laughs> that we, we, uh, we need to start using it more, but we have been using it for like almost 40, 50 years. Uh, it, and we've been using it to like some extent. It was said in the video, it, use, it makes up 10% of our energy already. So we do know uh, what its effects are at a very small level, but we don't know enough to do it safely. And uh, especially because all of the people who know what they're doing are, are working at the cores, and they're the ones who are killed when, uh, when disasters happen. So when disasters happen, they're killing off the people who know what they're doing. That's the problem. No. So with the nuclear energy, like Louis said, who said that we are using natural resources. We've been using natural resources since the dinosaur age and since the meat, like all the way back. And we are going to be running out of natural resources. So. When we run out of natural resources, what's going to happen? We're going to turn to so um, nuclear energy to power because we're going to be running out of coal. We're going to be running out of oil. And even though we do have solar, nuclear energy is probably going to be our go-to. But if we do start using it more often, we can learn about it, do research, and make it safer for the populace to use so that way we don't have a meltdown that can cause a bunch of freaking health problems. Okay, so there's some problems. So first of all, uh, we, we, don't, we don't know exactly how much oil and coal there is left in the world, but I, we're not close to using it all up. Uh, that It will happen eventually, you're right, but we've got enough time to at least do a lot more research safely. Um, and not to mention there are way more other alternative energy sources than just nuclear fuel. Uh, there is there's solar and there's wind and there's water. And there's uh, the people are starting to look at different ways to generate electricity without using atomic uh, energy. And so atomic energy, like we don't have to start using it right away for it to be uh, for for us to learn more about it. We can uh, still use other energies to to prevent us from running out of fossil fuels and stuff. Um, and yeah, like we don't we we're not running out any time soon. We've got plenty of time to do more research before we make any decisions. Okay, I'm going to stop it here. <coughs> Thank you for everyone that participated. Go ahead and get back to your seat. I want you to take a minute and write down what you think at this point, and then I'm going to say a few more words. <coughs> Mr. Ashcraft, did you need something? Okay, all right.
Okay. <laughs> so take a few minutes, write down what you think. What you think. Yeah, that's okay. If you want to add to it, add to it. I'm going to give you about a minute, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit. When you're finished writing down your thoughts, go ahead and look at me so I know that we're ready to go ahead. Okay, it looks like most are, are ready. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about what some of the things that were brought up. The first one was the CO2 and the greenhouse gases and causing the earth to warm. That's actually happening. And the more CO2 that is put out, we're losing glaciers, we're losing all these things. And scientists are starting to raise the alarm. If we keep using coal and fossil fuel, the CO2 gases will get higher and higher, will get hotter and hotter. Our cycles of winter, summer, spring, that kind of thing that we have around here are going to change. If they change, then our growth periods are going to change. And other things can change. Um, our, um, in the Ar Antarctic right now, there is a shrinking of the um, polar ice caps. And that's where the sills and the ocean life depend on those, ocean, those ice caps to have their babies and keep safe from wells and things like that. So there's a lot of things that are going on that are changing. And, and you know, eco cycles, if you've been through biology, you know, if one of the things is missing, sometimes it can adapt and sometimes it can't. So that's a problem. Gas, coal, oil cause the problem. Right? Okay, so looking at the other side, I'm not telling you I'm pro or against, okay? I'm just going to give you some more facts. So that's a problem. We know we have that problem, okay? We use gas, coal, and oil a lot, okay? We're dependent on it. And when that happened in the 1970s where the, we had the oil crisis and, and people were lined up for long periods of, of you probably don't remember because you probably weren't even alive, but they were lined up to get a gallon of gas for a long ways, and you had to pay for it. And then all of a sudden we got more fuel efficient cars. We, you know, it forced us to go forward in technology. What's happened with nuclear is that technology sort of been stagnant because we haven't used it. Um, to the point where we could because we haven't had the investors. Remember it talking about needing investors? Well, you need money in order to do research. It's just like cancer. You know, if they want to do cancer research, they got to raise money to do that kind of thing. Same thing with nuclear. Now, at the very end, it talked about thorium, right? Thorium has a half-life of only a couple hundred years after the, the, what's left over. Only has a couple hundred years before it's stable. So and it makes a lot less waste than what we've got right now. So they're starting to produce thorium reactors. But people are afraid of nuclear waste. They're afraid of nuclear, why? Because these things, just like airplanes when they fall and crash, they're publicized, right, a lot. But when somebody gets in a car crash, is it publicized a lot? There's thousands and thousands of car crashes a day thousands and thousands of people that die in car crashes a day, but they're not publicized. Same thing with oil, with coal, with gas mining. Um, there's thousands of people that die every day because of it and because of the products that are produced. So is one better than another? There's pros and cons to both, and I want you to understand that, and I want you to be able to, in your own mind, decide for yourself what are you willing to risk and what are you not willing to risk. They're looking right now at get, getting solar cars. What? Well, the skin of the car would be covered with solar cells that would drive the car. So it wouldn't need to be plugged in at night. It wouldn't need to be, you know, but they've got to have batteries that can hold the charge, right? Because if I want to drive at night and I've got a solar car, I've got to have some battery juice to make it wherever I'm going, right? 
Okay, so lots of things are in the works, but it's all driven by what? The dollar, money. It's all about money, honey, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and go forward. I want you to understand basic concept of a nuclear reactor. Now, the thorium reactors, they all work about the same, but it's just the fuel inside. Okay? They've got pellet reactors. They've got all kinds of different kinds of reactors. If you did nuclear reactor and you did a search on Google, you get tons of different scenarios on how they work. This is a basic water um, reactor. So let's see how this nuclear works. Reactor. In this video, we're going to learn about the nuclear reactor. I'm going to turn that up, Val. Nuclear reactors are the modern-day devices extensively used for power generation as the traditional fossil fuels... Sorry, it pauses every time I do ...like coal are at the breach of extinction. Not A really nuclear breach, reactor yeah. is the source of intense heat, which is in turn used for generation of power in nuclear power stations. Its mechanism is similar to that of a furnace in a steam generator. The steam is used to drive the turbines of the electric generator system. A nuclear reactor consists of three crucial components, fuel elements, moderator, and control rods. Fuel elements come usually in the shape of thin rods of about one centimeter in diameter and contain fissionable nuclei like uranium-235 or uranium-238. Which are usually in pellet form. These rods there. vary in number according to the size of the reactor. In large power reactors, thousands of fuel elements are placed close to each other. This region where the, these fuel elements are placed is called the reactor core. These fuel elements are normally immersed in water, which acts as a moderator. The objective of a moderator is to slow down the energy neutrons in nuclear reactor, which are produced during the nuclear fission process by the fuel elements. Thermal neutrons, which are the neutrons with energy of about 0.04 electron volts, are capable of producing fission reaction with uranium-235. During the fission reaction process, new neutrons are given out, which have energies of about 1 MeV. This is 1 mega electron volts. These neutrons typically escape from participating in another fission process, as they are accompanied by enormous energy release. In fact, the probability of these neutrons produce another fission reaction is 500 times less than that compared to a thermal neutron. This is where a moderator is extremely useful. Moderators have the capability to slow down, or in other words, moderate, the speeds of these high-energy neutrons so that they can in turn be used for a chain reaction to trigger multiple fission reactions of other uranium-235 nuclei. Commonly, Ordinary or heavy water is used as a moderator in nuclear reactors because of the deuterons present in them, which are capable of slowing down the neutron speed. Water molecules in the moderator are useful in slowing down the high-energy neutrons, which leave the fuel element after nuclear fission. These high-energy neutrons collide with water molecules, thereby losing out on some energy with every collision and therefore slowing down substantially. A new fission reaction can now be triggered using this slow neutron by striking it with a fuel element. The third and most prominent part of a nuclear reactor are the control rods. In order to get a steady output of energy from the nuclear reactor, every single fission reaction should trigger another fission reaction and ensure the availability of spare neutrons released to trigger the chain reaction. By controlling the number of spare neutrons available at any given time, the rate of nuclear fission chain reactions can be controlled. This control on the fission reaction can be maintained using control rods. The main function of the control rods is to absorb any excess or spare neutron in the moderator in order to prevent any further fission reactions. Usually, such control rods are made of boron or cadmium. To increase the rate of fission reactions, these rods can be removed from the moderator. A steady output of energy can thus be maintained by inserting or removing the control rods in the nuclear reactor. Now that we know the components of a nuclear reactor, let's understand the working of a nuclear reactor. It's usually enclosed in a shield made of thick concrete walls. It consists of a reactor core, pump, and heat exchanger. 
The reactor core and pump are placed in contact with the water, which is usually the heat exchanger in these reactors. Due to the enormous amount of heat released during the fusion reaction, the surrounding water gets heated up and changes to steam, which is in turn used to turn the turbines. So huge heat energy gets converted into electrical energy. Water is continuously flown in and out of the nuclear reactor using the pump. So a nuclear reactor successfully generates nuclear energy from fission reactions. So the, you'll notice the pumps are extremely important. The pumps are what went down in Chernobyl. They turned them off to see if they were working. Don't ask me why. Um, they also are some of the areas where we can have problems. Notice that there's basically three systems. Um, you have the reactor core. It is its own system. It never comes directly in contact with the heat exchange. It goes through it, but it's not actually, the water inside the reactor core is not actually in the heat exchange. This right here goes out to what you know you mostly see as the big um, cooling towers that everybody says is the nuclear power plant. You know what they was talking about? Um, those are actually just big cooling towers where they take this hot water out and cool it down and then send it back in to be heated up again. Okay? So we need to know understand a couple things. And they are in nuclear energy we have fission reactions. Fission reactions are when we split into smaller parts. So we're going to break it apart, and they're going to be about the same size when we break it apart. So two basically equal parts. And that happens when we bombard something with, with neutrons. Bombard means what side of the reaction? Reactants or products? Remember that from last time? Bombard comes from... If I'm going to be bombard or capture, it goes on the reactant side. Okay? A chain reaction is what they were talking about in the side the nuclear core. So if a chain reaction starts, if we don't moderate or stop some of these neutrons, it's going to keep exploding, exploding, exploding out. Then we get a nuclear bomb. Okay? Because it's out of control. We've got way too many neutrons. Okay, so a nuclear chain reaction in which the product of one keeps repeating and repeating. It's sort of like a genealogy char chart if you've ever done one of those. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. It doesn't go back down. Okay, unless everybody's killed off. So, an expanding or branching chain reaction, a critical reaction is a constant chain um, reaction. So, I, I have taken care of these neutrons and I just keep going forward with the same amount. That's what they were talking about with a control rod. So if I remove the control rods, then I end up with an expanding one, okay? Um, to control the, the chain reaction, I put a, a control rod in, okay? So if I have um, just a, there we go, constant rate. Are we all right? Going forward? Wait. Okay. All right. So supercritical reaction refers to the system where the production rate of neutrons is greater than the loss of neutrons, and therefore the neutron population increases. And if we have an increase of population of neutrons, if we don't stop controlling it, we end up with our expanding chain reaction. Now, these fuel rods get to what be what they call spent. So there's a point where the control rods are all the way down next to the, to the um, fuel rods to keep the reaction under control. But after a while, the fuel starts to become spent. They pull the control rods out and out to keep the reaction steady. And there's a point where the control rods are all the way out and the reaction starts to slow down. They've got to take those fuel rods out and, and re replenish them with new fuel rods. That's what they were saying about recycling them. There's still stuff that's radioactive in it, but it's not enough to keep heat the water to keep it going to steam enough. Okay? We're going forward, maybe. Okay, so critical mass, this is the minimum amount of fissional 
fissionable material that's needed to sustain a critical chain reaction. This is what I was talking about with a constant rate. So we've got to have a specific amount in there. Supercritical mass is the minimum, minimum amount of fissionable material that must be present to cause branching chain reaction to occur. So it, growing chain reaction, in other words. We good? Okay, so here's another look at it. In the reactor, we usually use uranium-238. So uranium-238, what I was telling you before, is a closed system. This is, there's three basic systems. The first one, reactor core. Reactor core and the generator the, of the heat, the first part of the steam generator, is all enclosed in the five feet of concrete minimum. Okay, so if something goes wrong, it can, it's contained. In order for radiation to get outside of this, it has to have a system break from here to here, then it can go out. Okay? We have a pump inside, we have a pump outside. This is a steam generator, it goes to the turbines. From the turbines it starts to condense, but it's still not cool enough to put it back in, because if we put hot water back in, it, it goes to steam very fast, and they need to have it controlled. So they send it out to... Um, to, to condense it, they've got to have cool water. So they, again, take uh, some water, and these things right here are cooling towers. So you'll see steam coming off because of the heat that's inside of it. Okay? Um, the first reactors that they did, they, they made sure they were near a reservoir or some lake, but they found that by doing that, it was actually raising the temperature of the reservoir or lake, and what was a good trout stream now went to a bass stream. And they don't do that anymore, they would just reuse the water. Okay, so this is what would happen. This would be my parent. This is a daughter. The daughter then comes down here and decays to Neptunium, which then decays. So this is, this is what we call a chain reaction. Okay, it keeps decaying. We now have plutonium 239, and plutonium 239 gets hit by a neutron and we end up with barium and strontium and two other neutrons. So it's a chain reaction that keeps going and going and going. It just doesn't stop at one decay. Um, we end up getting a lot of different things. I think that's the last one on that. Yep. Yeah, I, sorry. I just wanted to make sure that was the last one that was showing. Okay, we good? Ready? Okay. All right, so nuclear fusion, instead of fission, like it's taking it apart, fusion is putting it together. So nuclear fusion requires very, very high temperatures to start, very, very high accelerations to fuse things. That's how they've got the last ones, but they've had to hold it at a minus, you know, something Celsius, which is basically close to 273 Celsius, um, to zero Kelvin um, in order to do that. But they've been doing it with one atom. Okay, but it's causing it to, f to fuse. A few years ago, University of Utah came out and said, oh, we've come up with cold fusion. Uh, it was proven unsuccessful. Um, they weren't able to replicate it. So what is nuclear fusion? This is a joining together of two or more light nuclei to form larger nuclei. Um, so we've got hydrogen or deuterium and hydrogen-3 tritium undergo fusion to create helium. 
and a neutron. A neutron and a large amount of energy also are produced. Um, fusion is not currently usable as an energy source because it has to be done at very high temperatures and pressures. And the only way we've been able to do a large amount of it is in a nuclear bomb. And that's not controllable. Okay. So just basically, what is nuclear fusion? Okay. We good there? Problem is the high temperature, the high temperature. So nuclear fusion, we're putting two things together. We get a larger uh, atom, and we get off lots of energy. Okay? That's what happens in the sun. But we can't control the sun. Okay? That's the end for today. Woohoo! All right, so let me see what your next page is, which is the next time. So we have time that you can finish your lab. If you have not finished your lab, get it finished. Get this uploaded as daily work 2.2. So next one will be 12.3. So if you want to put it at the top of the next page, 12.3, that irradiation of food, that will be our next one, 12.3. So this is 12.2. Okay, and if you need to go back and finish the lab from last time, go ahead and do that.